Welcome to the first webinar in the Sizeware Educational Webinar Series. My name is Ed Chow. I'm Sizeware's VP of Business Development. I'll be your moderator today. First, I'll go over some ground rules for our webinar. For the presentation, I've muted all of our participants. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat window at the bottom of the GoTo meeting dialog. You see uh, close to the bottom, about four lines up from the bottom, you see something that says "Able Chat" and an arrow pointing right. Just click on that arrow, and expand it, and allow you to type in any questions you have. Um, this will we'll gather questions as we go, and then address them at the end of the webinar, so we can run the webinar uninterrupted. Now, I'd like to introduce our, or introduce our presenter for today, Eric Kaiser. Eric's a geophysicist who's had a successful career finding hydrocarbons. Uh, he's actually pictured on the left here. You can see him. Uh, with a cool snow background. He's an avid skier and he's managed to get in 28 days this year, which is fantastic. He started his career at Amoco working on interpretation and technical projects and spent 28 years there. He then moved on to Canada where, working in partnership with Anna Darko and Conco Phillips, he helped discover the fourth largest onshore gas field in the Mackenzie Delta. Eric is now at Modern Resources where he strives to apply more advanced geoscience in a cost and time effective manner that can be used in everyday workflows. So without further ado, I will pass the mic on to Eric, and we can get this webinar going. Well, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Ed for the opportunity and Sizeware to do this. I use Sizeware on a daily basis, and it's nice to be able to uh, give back a little bit. Uh, Modern Resources is a company. This is a small uh, startup. Uh, our funding comes from ARC Financial uh, in Calgary and NCAP in Houston. Uh, the problem that we've had at uh, Modern, and I think all the resource plays that are out there, is that production is not always the same. And what I've been able to look at and to follow over the years is using as methyl anisotropy P to predict the production. And I've been quite successful. I've got a very nice examples of it. Uh, where this really starts is in 1986 when I was at Amoco at the research lab in Tulsa, Leon Thompson publishes weak elastic anisotropy. And what he was pointing out in mostly math equations is, is how velocity varies uh, as mutually. Uh, I didn't get too excited until uh, in 2005, Yves Simon goes and publishes a paper of stress and fractor uh, fracture characterization. This was done using uh, Devon for about a 10 year period, uh, did a lot, allowed their scientists to publish papers uh, explaining uh, the Barnett Shale. And this was the example that got me really excited to say, holy shoot, you can actually use seismic to predict a better frac well. And in 2008, Greg Davidson goes in and he actually writes some code. Instead of doing it the complicated way, he looked at the code and just wanted to measure time differences. I saw the patterns he did and I became very excited because I said, they look geologic. They don't look like fractals or some math function, weird math function. And I said, the time differences were small, always less than 20 milliseconds, uh, but it looked like the geology. And then we had a few impact craters that I did some early tests on, and I got exactly the back the results indicating uh, what they should be. So that got me all fired up. In 2015, um, Modern drilled an east-west line, and then another operator drilled a diagonal that was twice as long, but it had similar production. So then the question came up, well, why did the short well produce the same amount as the diagonal well? And the diagonal well was drilled diagonally uh, where it was parallel to the mountain front and should be optimum for the stress factors. But this didn't make any sense. Then in 2017, we drilled a north-south, a north-south well that was into the best geology uh, best net to grow, and yet it was half the production. And finally, in 2018, looking at the geomechanical properties explains the production differences. And we've done this now. We've got three cases that has been very significant, but we always review the stress anisotropy before we select the orientation to drill a well. This is the uh, cumulative uh, production versus time. On the axis, on the x-axis, we see normalized time in months. So after 18 months or a year and a half, we're making a little bit shy of 2 BCF. 
Our initial well, which was the short one, east-west, uh, the type curve is almost identical to the one that's twice as long. And yet, so it's, why is that? We never quite figured out. The geology was very similar. But where it really became apparent, we drilled the north-south well, and the prediction we had, it should be the best. This well we fracked with the most intensive fracks. We use 1.5 tons per sand per meter. The other wells were drilled like with a slightly over one, so we put 50% more sand to keep the fractures open. Uh, the net to gross on this well was 83% net to gross, where I take a look, our, lit, our short uh, east-west well is only 64% in the reservoir. So we said, well, listen, this top one should be the best, and it's by far, it's half the production of the other. So something didn't make sense. If it isn't due to geology, what could it be due to? So that's where the geomechanical properties really need attributes need to come in. So this is the one of the uh, slides that were out of this key paper. It was uh, a master's thesis uh, that uh, Yves Sissanon actually did under Kurt Mofford at the University of Houston. Uh, Devin provided the data is my understanding. Uh, if we take a look at the data, we see in red, we see large anisotropy. And if you notice that the drill path is drilled parallel to the stress vectors, and the micro seismic, which are sort of the green dots, has a limited response. So I said, okay, this is when we drill parallel. And the next example he had is we're drilling now perpendicular to the stress. The pastel colors you see here are measuring small anisotropy and we see extensive microseismic response. So this was the data set that convinced me we need to look at uh, anisotropy with a lot more detail because we can explain a good microseismic response versus a limited and hence the production. I would have loved to have seen the production on these wells, uh, but that information was not made available. Then the clock goes ahead and in about 2008, Greg Davidson uh, had some time on his hands and said, well, let's look at this anisotropy. Let's go in and measure. If we notice that the uh, uh, Thompson paper indicates that the inside traces really have a minimal uh, effect, so we threw those out. And then what we did was we broke up in orientation. In this situated diagram, we're looking at four vectors uh, sets. Uh, practically, I'm actually using eight. I've tested on 16, but I think eight's pretty optimum. And for the diagram, we throw away the inside trace, which is the first trace, and then we fit a sine curve, which are the little red dots, uh, fit a sine curve, and then we can measure uh, ac uh, an angle, which is where the maximum deflection, and we can measure the amplitude along that trace. So with that information, we can plot it and make a map. This is the best example I have. And this was one I shared with Eloise Lynn, and she became quite excited. We have an isotropic trace where everything is the same in all directions on the left. And then the gather, the anisotropic gather, is right over top of a wrench fault, which is uh, in Albania. And we can see it's flat at the top. Uh, then when we step down, it's a frown, another frown, a smile. And if we look at the smile, we can see the angle, the maximum time is at about uh, 45 degrees versus the maximum time it varies on the bottom, it's shifted over and it's probably closer to about 80 degrees. So we see the vertical section changing. So this looks, it is real, we can measure it and we see an, a maximum amount is about 20 milliseconds. Uh, this is the case of the poor well that when we tried to frack, it's half the production of the other wells. And if you notice that the toe of this well is in the high stress zone to the south. Uh, the, where I've picked A is in the middle of the section where it's all a low amplitude stress. Here we're looking at a maximum of four milliseconds. So we're measuring very subtle differences. I'd like to thank uh, Kurt Moffert for his K positive curvature of all the hundreds of attributes out there. I've gotten more significance out of K positive curvature than anything else. 
Kurt says, well, he does it uh, more accurately than the rest. Uh, it, it takes more time, uh, but you get a big enough computer. I'd also like to thank my uh, the processor uh, CNC systems. They actually converted Kurt's code to run and showed the, the University of Oklahoma how to run that code under normal uh, Windows computers, which made all of this possible. But the curve, I like to use the curvature, and then I put the vectors on top of it. The next slide we have is in the maximum, uh, right at the toe where the completion was started. And if we notice we're flat at the top, there's a bit of a smile uh, at the flare D where we're chasing the gethane as a similar signature. And by the time we get down to the Nordic, we can go in and see it's the frown. So this tells me what we're measuring is very real and it's something that varies in a vertical. So I get quite excited when I take a look at that. The next way to look at the gathers, these are all as methyl gathers uh, along the whole well profile. And to the south, which is on the right hand side, we can go and see wobble in the section. And I'm saying wobble, it's flat. When we get up from the cardium, everything's well behaved. Down to the Nordic, it's more or less well behaved. And we can see the effects of this anisotropy right on the raw gathers. We see the same st uh, stresses over on the map. We can see the high stress to the south and then a very low amplitude. If we go back to taking a look at how fracks actually work in the rocks, this is a paper from Keel in uh, 1964, and it shows you this is pretty old technology. We pressure up and we have the break, the formation breaks down at a max pressure. We pump lots of sand into the solution. Uh, and then at some point, the sand, the pressure starts to increase. We turn the pumps off and then the frac stage stops. Then in 1981, Nolte and Smith had a key paper uh, that defined how fracks are going to break in the rock. And as we pump up and things are flat, we're pumping sands going into the formation, we're getting these very large fracks, and then at some point one of two things happens. Uh, one is all of a sudden you break into a pre-existing zone and the pumps can't keep up, and we do this type 4, which says we're not fracking new rock. Or the other thing that happens is all of a sudden you can sand off, the pumps are going and the pressure increases very rapidly and nothing's changing. So you're not breaking new rocks if the pressure increases or new rocks if the pressure decreases. So that's when you stop the experiment. So then we start to look at data and what happened, uh, I have two stages and the first one is stage one. If you notice that the blender slurry rate we could only get to a maximum of about five, if, uh, five cubes a minute, and which is not enough to break the rocks. We know in this area, 10 cubes a minute is where we get the most effective fracks occurring. The green, you can see how the sand is sort of has been added. This whole stage took an hour and 45 minutes, which was a long time. We were monitoring the pressure all the time. We we're quite concerned as we started. You can see the pressure jumped up to about 55 MPA. We were concerned there might be mechanical difficulties if we uh, pumped at a higher pump rate. The stage where things become more or less uh, normal is stage 22. We get this beautiful signature, the pressure goes up and then the pressure drops down and then it increases up at the end. We're able to get our blender slurry rate up to 10 cubes a minute and then everything falls off at the end of the stage 22. So 22 is the way ideally all frac stages uh, should perform. My estimation is a lot of the reserves that are coming out are only coming out of these few stages with this signature. What we have here is a dashboard. And what I'm showing on the dashboard is we start off with the frac stages are the vertical lines. I've got the pressure at each stage. So at the toe of the well, we can see the pressure and our pump rate is sitting down at about five cubes. We don't get to the maximum pump rate until we get over to stage, stage 22, which is much closer to the heel. In the next plot, we have uh, rows diagrams at all our stages and we look at the angle of the drilling of the well, which is the vertical green line that you can see here versus the uh, angle of the anisotropy we measure. And at the toe of the well, which had the problem, you can go in and see we're within 10 degrees of this angle and we're having problems with the pressure plot I put on. The pressure is the top and then the pump rate. So you can see there's a big separation of the two. 
And those lines only come together about stage 22 is the classic. And that's where the pressure and the pump rate gets up to 10 cubes and we get uh, uh, that's effective. We have another observation in the middle of the well. We clearly went out of zone and we can see as we measure the stress and isotropy, you can see we've got two dominant trends in north, south and east, west. This is probably a fracture system. If we completed this zone, I would think there's a high probability of the uh, energy is going out of the section and isn't cracking the rocks that you think it should. Uh, we're also plotting uh, the porosity, and this is a visual porosity because we can't afford to run fancy tools. Uh, and we can see the porosity at the toe of the well is sitting at about uh, six or seven, seven percent. And if anything, that porosity is better than the porosity over stage, uh, stage 22. The last plot is the whole experiment. In this case, the toe is where we start and the heel is on the right hand side. So you can see the problems we had uh, with the fracking experiment. And then I've selected off the ones that are highlighted are the same ones that are up to the top. So this is a convenient display that we use to look at what's happening as we frack, after the frack, let's compare what angle. These are the vectors that we on our east-west well. And if you notice that the scale here is at two and a half, so it's almost half of the scale of the north-south well. You can see that this well, the stages, we're looking at all these uh, the polygons with the stage numbers. You can see the vectors are more or less north-south. The sum of all the stages are basically what's in this uh, a polygon. So this is an east-west well. Uh, and it's, I think, the reason it uh, was quite effective. If we look at the same diagram uh, earlier, we can see the drill angle is the green line on all these plots. And if we noticed at the toe, we're right perfect that the green line were perpendicular, the stress vectors to the drilling of the well. That's ideal. If we look at this well, you can see along and compare the gamma below, we can see the lithology we change, we go to shale. And when you're drilling, you can do one of three things. You can, uh, uh, the driller wants to change, uh, changing a bit. They want to steer, do they go up, do they go down or straight ahead? You can see the decision here was made. We're out of the good rock. We're going to head up because we know there's another sand package up above and maybe we'll get into it. I find it quite intriguing that this is still a good well and yet only 64% of the well was actually in the reservoir section. But the geomechanical properties are, we're drilling at a far more favorable angle to crack the rocks and get effective uh, uh, production. There's only one stage that has sort of mixed uh, rose diagram uh, stress vectors, which would, could be a zone of interest. It's where I've seen uh, things that occur, vertical fractures or other problems. But where things are dominant stress, we've gone perpendicular, that's a good well. If we look at the diagonal well, all I have are the stress vectors at the toe of the well were more or less perpendicular, but by the time that we go along uh, for half the well, you can see that we're parallel. There's large, many stages that are drilled to parallel to the fractures. So the conclusion here is that as muthal angle and residual magnitude should be interpreted before we drill our wells. The regional trend is not sufficient. We can see much higher production if we take the local information and adjust the drilling angle. Desired pump rates and effective fracking can be achieved when drilling near perpendicular to the stress direction. And geomechanical properties can explain production differences for resource wells. And I think I've shown that the geology doesn't seem to be nearly as important as the geomechanical properties. So Ed tells me we have some questions here. Yes, thanks, thanks, Eric. Great presentation. We do have a question from Robert. The question is, how are the rose diagrams, the information for the rose diagrams gathered for the frac stages? Well, how that information, if we take a look at our best well, uh, here are all the rose diagrams. You can see the angle is east-west and then the stress diagram. And if we go to the previous, the way we collect it is we have all the frac stages. Some stages, our ports are farther apart than others. We create a series of polygons. I've gone out 150 meters on either side, collect all the data points. We're doing this analysis at our natural bin spacing, which is 30 meters. So we typically have about 100 data points uh, in each one of these boxes. 
And I also have another polygon that if you see this lower polygon, uh, all of the stages are displayed in this one polygon. So right there, there's several hundred stages being used, but it really does confirm if we see each individual stage uh, what's happening. So I think that was a great question to ask. And uh, I'd like to thank Ed again for the opportunity to present this. And do we have any more questions? Um, yes. Not for now. If you have any others, please email us and we can address them and send them out when we send out to recording this webinar. Thanks again for attending. We really appreciate it and we'll see you at our next one. Thanks.